in his book death sadguru talked about his previous lives he said there are any number of lifetimes which are there in my memory but i don't pay attention to any of that i have a piece of life in zambia for example but i pay attention only to that which has been spiritually significant in some way the rest of it is of no consequence there are many things around me today which are a legacy of my past but i have carried only those things which are of spiritual significance who my mother was who my father was who my brothers were who my sisters were who my children were in all those past lives i can pursue them very easily but i will not i have not paid any attention to them only those who were with me in spirit not in flesh or blood i have nurtured them those who were with me in flesh and blood i leave them to the earth because it is to the earth that they belong in that sense i consider only my last four lifetimes significant vilva in the early 1600s there lived a young man in a small village presently known as raigarh in the central indian state of chhattisgarh his name was vilva he was a tribesman who lived a wild and intense life there is a certain tradition in india where some people called the pudubudukush just walk through the streets usually very early in the morning when it is still dark they wake you up with their drum beats intuitively if they see something they will tell you they may say for example that death will occur in such and such house in two weeks or someone will fall ill somewhere and so on generally people paid attention to this spontaneous utterance because they were known to come true if nothing came to them that day they would simply sing songs in praise of shiva after this they would go and sit in a temple for some time where people would go and make some offerings to them this was a tradition within the shiva culture where this particular tribe of people is also involved in snake charming snakes and shiva are deeply connected vilva belonged to a tribe like that vilva was deeply in love with what he was doing these were people who lived totally loving life for what it is they were not the kind to accumulate anything they had no sense of money property or possessions they simply lived and shiva was the most important aspect of their lives vilva loved snakes mind you snakes are generally poisonous if you are kind of who loves poisonous creatures you have to be a different kind of person to kiss a snake you must be very very courageous he was a person for whom love meant everything the rest was secondary being alive itself was secondary that is the kind of person he was he was someone who could not fit in the social structure and was locked upon as a rebel for one of the many rebellious acts he did was not respecting the prevalent caste distinction he was put to death at a very young age by a cobra's bite while he was tied to a tree at that time you could not really call him a spiritual person he was a devotee of shiva but during those last few moments of his life he watched his breath there was nothing else he could do and breathe watching just happen the cobra's venom entered his body and his breathing became very labored death was just a few minutes away during this time he watched his breath it was more of a consequence than a conscious awareness beaten by a cobra and left to die he was lying face down almost dead yet he managed to be aware 
of those last few minutes of life this was more out of grace rather than any sadhana from those few minutes of breath watching he knew spiritual progress began which changed that person's future in so many different ways shiva yogi in his next two lifetimes he was a very intense seeker of the ultimate nature shiva was his way both the times he was known as shiva yogi in the first life of sadhana he died at the age of 37 he had no disease just hunger and the intensity of his sadhana did him in he did not die enlightened but he died in full dignity the second time over he fared better he lived up to 55 years of age he went through heart breaking sadhana but still final realization had not happened at this point he was bestowed the ultimate grace usually i don't talk about my guru he was called shri balani swami and was a being beyond proportions that was not his real name but he was so called because he had attained to a certain samadhi state near the town of balani in tamil nadu he remained in this state for about two and a half years after that he wandered all over the country enlightening many people he came to shiva yogi in the second lifetime and bestowed his grace upon him a forlorn sadhaka when this shiva yogi saw him he recognized that this was the guru until then he would not accept any human being as his guru for him shiva was the only guru he wanted shiva to come and initiate him but when he saw shri palana swami he recognized that this being was at the very peak of consciousness and he offered himself but somewhere there was a little resistance because he could not offer himself to another man he would only offer himself totally to shiva so the guru out of compassion took the form of shiva himself shiva yogi surrendered shri palani swami did not even touch him with his hand or foot he just took his staff and tapped on shiva yogi's agna chakra or forehead at that moment shiva yogi attained to his ultimate nature this contact with the guru lasted only a few hours after that they never met again but they were constantly in touch shri palana swami attained mahasamadhi in the vellinagiri mountains somehow he identified shiva yogi as a person suitable for establishing the dhyana linga he entrusted this work to him not in speech not in words but wordlessly he communicated the immense technology needed to consecrate the dhyana linga so shiva yogi began working towards establishing the dhyana linga he was not able to fulfill his guru's vision in that lifetime because of limited resources and lack of support so the rest of his time in that lifetime he spent mostly with his eyes closed sadguru shri brahma to continue the work of creating the dhyana linga shiva yogi came back as sadguru shri brahma he started the work towards this in tamil nadu he traveled extensively in the state and established several small institution but his work on dhyana linga was centered around coimbatore here he faced a lot of social resistance from people as the dhyana linga is the highest manifestation of the divine it includes all aspects and manifestations of life so consecrating it involved men and women in very intense processes if a man and woman sit together people can only think of one thing so a lot of resistance came up and he was literally hounded out of this place he became very angry that he could not fulfill his guru's desire 
and left Coimbatore in great fury, as if on fire. Sadhguru Shri Brahma was alone. There was people here and there that had lit up, but he did not like anyone following him, so he was alone. Because he was alone, behind him there was a darkness, and it followed him and did not allow him to fulfill his purpose of his life. This is a good lesson for anyone, even such a magnificent human being as Sadhguru, Sri Brahma, who could do things which are not considered human or humanly possible, could not fulfill what he came for. And it does not matter how many things you do, if you cannot fulfill the purpose that you have stood up for, that is considered as failure. Sadhguru Sri Brahma failed and he did not like that. He did not like it one bit. So knowing the only emotion that he knew, he got angry. He was always angry, not about anything or anyone, but anger was his vehicle for intense existence. In that anger, he started to walk in no particular direction. Seeing his fairness, no one was able to go near him except for one disciple by the name of Vibhuti, who followed him. Sadhguru Sri Brahma walked without stopping to eat, sleep or even sit for three, four, five days. Sadhguru Sri Brahma knew he did not have that much time. He knew that because of certain karmic limitations, he would have to leave his body within next two years. When his head got little cooler and when he was able to put down the shame of resentment of failure a little bit, he settled down to make some very cold calculations. From being a fiery, exuberant, don't care a devil kind of yogi, he came down to being a cold calculation, a highly pragmatic, controlled fire. He sat down with his disciple and plotted how to make the Dhyana Linga happen in the next life. Many things were decided there, who should be involved in the consecration process, where they should be born, in which womb, how and what time, he plotted every aspect that would be required. Sadhguru Sri Brahma even decided what kind of a person he should be born as, how his physical body and state of mind should be. Everything was created right there. Fundamental blueprint for the Dhyana Linga was made in that Kadapa temple. Sadhguru Sri Brahma then came back to Coimbatore for the last time. He was heading up the Velangiri mountains, which also contained his Guru's Samadhi. There were many people gathered at the foothills that day. To them, he declared, This one will be back. Now Sadhguru Sri Brahma was supercharged with failure and having been unable to fulfill his Guru's will, he executed an extremely rare feat of exiting through the seven chakras all at once. He was one of the very rare masters who had mastery over the seven chakras and was referred to as Chakrashwara. He was only 42 years old at that time. He did this phenomenally rare thing as a preparation for the consecration of Dhyanalinga. Though he knew his failure was that of mismanagement of social situations, he was certaining for himself that it was not a lapse of his own ability. Exiting the body through all the seven chakras meant this person had complete mastery over all the 114 chakras. When people did not meet his expectations, he chose to shelve his effort and depart with a declaration, this one will be back. <laughs>